I will use a couple of minutes, as I always do, to make a couple of announcements. Good evening, everybody. Um, I will ask you to please turn off your phones or put them on silent so we don't uh, disturb our speaker. And before I introduce him to you, I would like to uh, announce uh, uh, the um, program for this semester at the Center for Translation Studies. This is our first lecture uh, during the spring semester. Our next lecture is going to be uh, in New Cairo on March 19th, and it will be delivered by Professor Nivin in Nosseri, who is a professor, associate professor of Francophone uh, Studies um, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And her uh, lecture is entitled um, Translating Defiance into Art, Tunisian Women's Revolution. Um, later on in March, or a week almost later, in Tahrir, uh, we will be hosting Abdel Megid in Mihilmi, author and translator. He will be lecturing in Arabic, and the title of his lecture is Mudalan. Um, and on May 8th, you all know that the spring semester is rather sketchy because of all the, you know, the, the mid-semester uh, break and all the other weekends that come up, so we have nothing during April, but on May 8th, we are hosting my colleague from the Department of uh, Philosophy, Omid Tofikian, uh, and his uh, lecture is a fascinating one based on his collaboration with one of the incarcerated, um, um, how can I call them, immigrants um, on Manus Island. Um, and the title of the talk is no Friend But the Mountain, Translation as Literary Experimentation and Shared Philosophical Activity. And you know, I really recommend all of them. They, they promise to be uh, fascinating. Um, let me now turn to our guest today, who is um, a very special guest and is going to be working very hard while at AUC. Um, Fedi Juda um, is a poet, translator, and medical doctor, and the combination always fascinates me. Um, and I'm sure that during the discussion you may want to ask him questions about that. Um, he has published three books of poems, The Earth in the Attic, A Light, and a book of short poems composed on a cell phone, Textu. Um, his fourth collection, Footnotes in the Order of Disappearance, is from Milkweed Editions. He has translated from Arabic the poetry of Mahmoud Darwish, as well as Ghassan Zaqtan and Amjad Nas Nasir. Fadi Juda was a winner of the Yale series of Younger Poets comp competition in 2007 and has received a Penn Award, a Banipal Prize from the UK, and the Griffin International Poetry Prize in 2013. He is also a Guggenheim Fellow, and he lives in Houston with his wife and children. Um, tomorrow, uh, Fedi will be lecturing at New Cairo, and his talk um, is from 1 to 2 in the afternoon, and is titled Science and Desire. On Saturday, he is one of two keynote uh, speakers at the International Graduate Student Conference in the memory of my mentor, a colleague, and very dear friend, Barbara Harlow. Um, and he, the other keynote speaker is a former AUC uh, colleague, uh, Ira Dworkin. And I would uh, encourage everyone here to try to attend. I'm sure that the papers will be, and the keynote uh, speeches will be uh, brilliant. Um, so as you can see, we're milking Fedi as he uh, is here for a very uh, short time. His talk this evening is entitled Psychology of Fragments, Translating Mahmoud Darwish. 
So without further ado, please help me welcome Fadi Jouda. Um, thank you everyone for coming and for having me. <coughs> um, I, I want to thank Barbara for uh, presenting me with a, a, an indirect gift and, and uh, Friel and others who invited me here and which led me to um, write, uh, uh, you know, begin to conceptualize this uh, paper on translation. Uh, so um, I approach translation as a poet more than uh, a scholar, so you'll have to forgive me. It's a little long, it's not done yet, and I'll maybe skip in between if I see anybody nodding off or taking deep sighs. Um, so, <clears throat> and if you don't like it, you can blame Friad for it. Where, where is she? Um, yes, yes, they, uh, I, I'll try to do that part. Um, in December 1997, I visited Dubai with my father. It was my first visit to the city, which hadn't yet risen to its current heights, as if a survivor in a sci film after a cataclysm has afflicted humans on Earth. I was halfway through my medical training in Houston, Texas, intent on returning from Dubai with a suitcase full of Arabic literary books. I had decided to pursue the life of a writer, a poet, and I wanted to lean on a tradition that was well rooted in me. My primary education was in Arabic, in the constancy of a Palestinian household whose travels and expulsion around the world had included years in Benghazi and Riyadh. Of the many books I bought were the two volumes of Mahmoud Darwish's collected poems, 1966 to 1992, the famous purple and green volumes. A few years later, in the new millennium, while randomly flipping through the purple volume, I came across Darwish's 1973 poem, Blessing to What Never Arrives, Tuba Lishayin Lam Yasal. Its opening stanza lit up my being as if I were in a PET scanner observing my own brain redirect all the blood flow into the parts where memory resides eternal. It was a dormant memory, like a Jedi's coming out of retirement or shaking off centuries of seclusion. As I read those lines, I realized not only that I had read them before, but also that I had known them by heart and still did and do. How was it then that I had forgotten what I still remember? And when was it that I first committed those verses to memory? I began to assemble bits and pieces of the story. My maternal uncle hands me a periodical that contains a Darwish poem in it. My task was to memorize its first stanza. I must have been a verbose four or five year old boy, which would place us somewhere in 1975. I was already enrolled in first grade, and while my capacity to read was precocious, I'm sure my uncle read the verses to me as I repeated them at least once to ensure accuracy. Maybe he traced the words with his fingers to show me how to pronounce them better as if deciphering hieroglyphics with all those diacritical marks and their associated sounds and rhythms. For my feat of memory, I'd get some coins. With the coins secure in my pocket, I'd go down with my older brother from our fourth floor apartment in the Mufti building in Benghazi to a kiosk by the entrance and buy the new edition of our favorite comics magazine, Al Amlaq, with its series of superheroes. The feeling of encountering those opening verses in Arabic at least 25 years later, a testimony to the mind's powers of custody, was more than a matter of archaeologic find in the brain regions where rote memorization is buried. It was also a deep feeling of belonging, of sorrow, of metaphysical triumph. I could have only unconsciously absorbed into my being as a member of a Palestinian family and not fully understood then in the manner with which I understand it now. This is the wedding that never ends, in a hall that never ends, on a night that never ends. This is the Palestinian wedding, where no lover, unless fugitive or martyr, returns to the beloved. Does anyone here know those lines in Arabic?
هذا هو العرس الذي لا ينتهي في ساحة لا تنتهي في ليلة لا تنتهي هذا هو العرس الفلسطيني لا يعود الحبيب إلى الحبيب إلا شهيدا أو شريدا Why was my uncle so moved by this? Was it something more than the specificity of a Palestinian's engrossment with their wounds? Decades would pass before I would solve the last piece of the puzzle. In February 1973, a family relative came to visit us from Beirut. This man, Abu Yusuf al Najjar, first cousin of my great maternal uncle, would be assassinated by the Mossad less than two months later on April 9, 1973 in Beirut. At our apartment in Benghazi, my dad expressed concern about the man's safety. Abu Yusuf and Najjar knew he was a dead man and had accepted his fate. The assassination I refer to here is what is commonly known as the Verdun opera operation which took the lives of three Palestinian figures in the wake of Golda Meir's launch of assassination as terror tactic against the PLO. A terror tactic that has become enshrined in the identity of Israeli politics since then. It was rumored that Darwish's blessing to what never arrives was a response to that civilized barbarism. Irrespective of the accuracy of that rumor, at the occasion of the poem, by the time it reached people's eyes, ears, mouths, and hearts, it became a private song. No Palestinian was unfamiliar with its senses. It was a lyric opening that described the most mundane daily emotion for a Palestinian at the height of the revolution. It was not a political poem, as we are now fond of saying, an echoic, herd-like custom. It was as private an emotion as the pain in one's hips or knees while going up a long flight of stairs. I was a member of a Palestinian household and through enormous energy fields of consciousness, I was more than witness to their grief. I was also a body for and of it. My mother's heart was cloven over her second cousins who are now orphaned. I walked around the reception room in our apartment, repeating those six lines until I made them mine. I never translated that poem in full or published it in part. I am not sure I will. Both in Arabic and English, some of Darwish's early poems are beyond our grasp in the present. There's a general incapacity, I believe, to read them as works of art where, in the words of Henry Miller, the individual triumphs over art. The labyrinth of politics in the Palestinian question seems to stand in our way of a more liberated reading of such works. But time is long as the road is long. Instead, we ask ourselves to look at those lines again in my English and ask, why did I choose hall for saha, and not arena, field, plaza, court, theater, ballroom, or more simply and nebulously, space? Weddings are held in halls. Conflicts are held in arenas. Marriage is rarely free of trouble. Dramas are held in theaters. Palestine is held in a field. Also, the syntactical inversion I chose in the last two lines. The most powerful and memorable lines in the stanza. What about that? Should I have said, no lover returns to another unless fugitive or martyr? And by doing so, highlight the condition of return as the primary emotion of the verse? Or should I, for the sake of a different cadence, have written this instead? A lover returns to his lover only as fugitive or martyr. And why not endless in place of that never ends? We say English does not have the music of Arabic or Arabic doesn't have the flexible amalgam of English, the lingua franca of our age. We say much is lost in translation, but forget what is gained. We slip into chauvinism and dogmatism, search for purity, and forget that to translate the poetry of Darwish is the primary task at hand, a Palestinian world within an Arabic one that radiates toward the specificities of a universal reach. Did Darwish cry when he wrote some of his poems? If so, 
It likely was during the composition of some of the longer poems. For anyone who has spent enough time talking with pen and paper, it is easily believable that you might cry while writing. You might also break into hysterical laughter, primal screams, euphoric dance, enchanted song, or transcendental tranquility. Which state do you enter when you read, which is also to say, when you translate and write Darwish? Who enters Darwish's text with their Palestinian baggage? You or me? What is Palestinian baggage? Who travels with it and how tenuous is the journey? Is the homeland stuffed in the suitcase of the poem or is the poem stuffed in the suitcase of longing? Is there a carousel for the suitcase or is it irretrievable and thus eternally imagined? What type of determinacy does each one of us possess when we travel into and with the Darwish poem as worldly poem, Arabic poem, Palestinian poem at the height of the nation state in the Anthropocene? I, for one, don't enter Darwish's text. It is already in me, like dreaming a thousand dreams over and over in a lifetime of sleep. How do you enter it? Do you enter it through reportage on the Palestinian people? And if so, does that necessitate your searching for native informants or taxi drivers who will utter facts that you transform into truths about the Darwish poem to serve your purpose in English? You play the witness, perform erasure as representation, confuse erasure for the art of disappearance. Simply put, when we say Darwish in English, we must also contend with the weight of the word Palestine in English. How one speaks about Palestine in English, how one feels Palestine in English, is a prerequisite for articulating it in the English poem. We call this translation. When we say translation, we've come reflexively to mean a twofold process. One that involves the so-called original work and its transference into another language. But transfer alone as mechanical relocation or translocation is not translation, just as a suitcase by itself is not travel. The so-called original work, when compared to the product of its transfer, is seen as original because its sources are difficult to trace, a difficulty compounded when examined in another language. Whereas the product of transfer bases itself on a traceable, known, though not always knowable, source whose building blocks are wholly identifiable word per word, whose corpus, whether classical or modern, is available, palpable, immediate. There is the primary text, and there is its secondary, copied, transferred version. There is a lender text and a borrower one. And as you lend, you borrow in a market of ideas, in a world of communicative capital, hell-bent on discovery, authenticity, commodification as breakthrough in the name of measurable progress. Take a minute and turn it off completely. It's okay. Thank you. To reiterate, both works, the template and its transferred image, are products of translation, early steps in the process. The former eludes our immediate archaeological skills. We cannot easily hold a mirror to it that captures it as copy or image of something else. At best, its non-original organs are engaged as intertextualities with other sources, ancestral or otherwise. No matter how hard we try with brush and chisel to restore or trace the so-called original work to its original state, we will always come up short. We will always come face to face with ruins, with incompleteness, with an endless journey in imagined pastime or unattainable space. The universe of origin, of consciousness, is both infinite and infinitesimal, and its echo is one. Instead, we fill the gaps with our desire for singularity in contemporary time. 
The result is original work. In turn, the copied image reflects an erasure of the subjectivity, authenticity, or originality of its author, its clerk. In transfer work, we make no room for two subjectivities in one. Or if there is room, by mere fact of two pens occupying and competing for the same space, then we have little interest in that duality as a merger of a new subjectivity. Yet there is no merger that is not an annihilation. We struggle to imagine the copied work, the product of transfer, as nothing but non-original, since its parental material is so readily and definitively traceable. Ironically, so much of what is considered original work is imitative. Nonetheless, we submit translation to conversations about fidelity and infidelity, humbleness and humility, all traditional precision and error, nativeness and foreignness, all traditional affiliative moralities that reduce art to the decrees of a church, a theogony. There is no merger that does not contain within it an annihilation between particle and antiparticle. It is not loss or gain, it is transformation. What does it mean that recent neuroscientific research shows the same parts of the brain as alive and engaged during translation as during the composition of a so-called original work? That language in its human confines between the innovative and its image is mere illusion? Singularity is largely a mind-body relation. Is neuroscience and molecular biology not in many ways the mirror image of astrophysics and quantum energies? Of course, advanced brain imaging and science do not the whole story tell. And I am not as, un, as uninterested as in the conversation of originality as I am in the procedural bylaws necessary for those to whom translation is an act of legalized forgery, mechanical reproduction, consensual plagiarism. What I am after is this. When we say translation, we omit two more components without which no translation is possible. I have mentioned the first two components, namely the need for a transferable text and the product of its transference, which have become the limit of our understanding of translation for the most part. The third essential component, however, is the condition of acceptance, as Edward Said suggested in his essay, Traveling Theory, although that wasn't about translation. By acceptance, I mean the willingness to participate in and shape receptivity. There is no translation possible without an audience for the transference of a work in a foreign tongue. If I translate Darwish in, into English, there must be an English reader. This reader must offer and be offered terms of reception, of acceptance, for the transferred work to be heard and read. These terms almost always find themselves in the conflict between hegemonic forces and those of critical consciousness, the consciousness that is given rise to by crisis." End quote. How does an English reader come to Darwish in English? What crisis of consciousness must they endure for acceptance to meet its potential beyond the reified experience in English of what Palestine is? The fourth point is the combined capacity of transfer and reception to produce a transformative work that opens the host language to unrealized or dormant energies within it. Otherwise, the entire process is a trap of technical copying that neither elevates what is borrowed nor what borrows it. Without acceptance of the transference, there is no completion of the circle wherein the so-called original, transferable text can be transformed further. It goes without saying, then, that translation also occurs within the same language and is not dependent on transfer between different alphabets, as it were. In this sense, reading is an act of critical consciousness and not mere loyal member of a pre-existing school of thought. In Darwish's case, I'd argue that translatability of his work in Arabic remains wanting, for example, 
even if this is a testimony to his brilliance, his magic act that eludes simple codification. Again, translation is not limited to the work of writing across languages. Translation always aims toward art as transubstantiation cautious of the folly of its own automatism. At its best, translation morphs into literary criticism through ungovernable mimesis and inimitable silence. Translation is a theory in motion, in flux, intra and inter language. Not all translated works or original works possess the excellence for such travel, and yet we translate so many works just the same. We bemoan the small number of translated works in English because it reflects in no small part our pathologic obsession with the self as original work, our predilection for subjectivity as ultimate expression of freedom in the form of the democratic act that is also a capitalist imperial performance. Much of what we perform in English translation reifies the same process of self-centrism through the mask of self-effacement, a willful blindness. We seek the ready-made, the microwavable resuscitation. Even when it's not pret a it is reduced and referred to other microwaves of comprehension. For example, if an Arabic text doesn't draw the English-speaking mind to a French or English predecessor or contemporary, then there is always Spanish literature. A translator must illuminate in English the sentient meadow that English has in its stores for Palestine. The means are many, but the words are one. Between the words, more so than behind them, there are silences, as John Genet put it. How then does one translate Palestinian silence? One must first identify that silence within themselves as translator and reader. There is no text, no poem without its silence. There is no life form without silence, even if we call it molecular silence. We can meander into the nature of silence, quote Ibn Arabi or the double helix, but ultimately where silence, inexpressible, ineffable, or otherwise, leads me is the spring of the untranslatable, or the so-called untranslatable. The multiplicity that constitutes life, biology on Earth, across and within species, is the translatable. At DNA level, there is the unwinding of the helical body, then the replication, but after that comes the translation of the replicated parent. Errors and mutations, though they're not many, occur along the way. Sometimes these aberrancies are as revolutionary as they are evolutionary. Often they allow for, allow for colorful subjectivities, no more or less. Each one of us is allegiant to one language over another, to one cultural formulation of identity over another. Rare is the person whose dance between two languages is akin to two bodies merging in one, as Al-Jahid suggested. Sometimes this mystic moment occurs and is sustainable only in episodes. For the most part, we remain captive to a survivalist ideation of the material, palpable matter of language, restricted to the mathematics of fidelity, accurate replicability, or the superimposable geometry of chemistry. One must allow for the uncertainty principle beyond the determinacy of two physical properties of a particle, between its position and momentum. Or, one must allow for chirality, where the mirror images are not superimposable, that translation is isomeric, it rotates the same light, but in different or opposite polarities. Or we can say that translation is transplantation, there is a donor body and a recipient one. There is graft versus host. There is intrusion and immunosuppression, or autoimmunity, and so on and so forth. Whatever the metaphor, the body is one. 
Translation is a biologic process without which no life is possible. Translation as a living thing allows for each past hegemonic diction and thought. Their guise, translation as a living thing allows for a reach past hegemonic diction and thought, their guise of usage and self-referentiality. I recognize that accuracy is necessary for the viability of life, but no complex life form is a perfect clone of its predecessor, nor should it be a perfect clone of its, in its new host. Even within life, with all its astounding methodologic precision, there is room for escape from disaster, room for evolution, a biologic version of critical consciousness, and my language, a metaphor for metaphor. Whether with silence or light, positionality of the heart or illocality of the mind, we can possess a resistance to translation as its primary allure. The resistance stems from what each one of us deems untranslatable. A euphemism for or vestige of one's fear of death or mutilation. That's the untranslatable. Like an addiction, or like an addiction, a dopaminergic loop, we seek the treasure hunt in translation and measure ourselves against the find. Mirror, mirror on the wall, is this me you've captured or someone I don't know at all? The hunt satisfies on occasion and bewilders on occasion between familiarity and strangeness. Desire accrues, is sated, then made hungry again between lack and machine, a psychology of fragments. I am not a believer in translation as the product of perfect technical eminence, a desiring of the divine, to borrow an expression from Lukash. Similarly, I am not a believer in the untranslatable. Translation's unsolvable imperfection is not a result of the untranslatable, the inevitably lost. Rather, it is a result of our barbaric longing for the godly. Everything can be named down to their perceived properties. There is nothing that is divine that the self can't become. Or whatever moments of perceived untranslatability are moments of divinity and encounters with the spiritual. Then translation is a mystical act where the self finds its oneness with the so-called untranslatable text and in the process of forging a new chiral chirality, the self annihilates itself into the text and the text into itself. I am not a believer in the commodification of the untranslatable, which I think is a fad now. The act of difficulty is not opposed to be promoted or exploited. To borrow again from Lukács' theory of the novel, translation then is the performance of, and I quote, irony as a negative mysticism to be found in times without God. If the translatable is the particle, then the untranslatable is the anti-particle. The text is part self, part other. If autoimmunity, if organ transplantation and immunosuppression, whatever it may be, translation is a metaphor for the limitation of human consciousness of recurrence. In this uncertainty, I choose translation as a liberation of the self from its limited, reified historical construction. My bias is that this liberation as a critical consciousness is especially true of poetry in translation. The more unrelated the two languages are, the more apparent, but not necessarily more meaningful or profound, the energy created from the merging of the translatable and the untranslatable. To paraphrase Halaj, a secret's meaning is apparent, its secret is its form. A translation of Darwish into Persian or Urdu, perhaps, into Mandarin or Hindi, Russian or Portuguese, is less likely to encounter the extent of strangeness or alienation as a translation into English might. 
But that does not mean that the translation into one of those languages engages the untranslatable in Darwish any less than English could. As I said, the difference is not necessarily in the work of transfer, but in the conditions of acceptance and transformation. In other words, the translatable, untranslatable complex, like that of an enzyme or an antibody antigen complex, is not confined to phylogeny or philology. Even across consanguineous languages, Latin-based or Indo-European, for example, where most translation into English is performed, even then, the translatable, untranslatable exists, if only in breath, in tempo of style, as Nietzsche would have it, across rhythm, echo, and music. Those least common denominators, the nucleic acids of the mutual space that the translatable shares with the untranslatable. For me, the art of translation resists affiliation with pre-established systems of feeling in the host language and does not lend itself to facile re-territorialization under the guise of mutualism and anxious cultural exchange that is subservient to power. The art of translation resists easy duplication, does not seek reproducibility in the form of mass comprehension or mass alienation. If this echoes a desire against war literature, quote unquote, as theorists of translation would have it in their recent wars, I would like to point out dif a difference between us. I speak from a non-imperial position. The viability of the, translatable, of the untranslatable is not a reification of power. Again, I do not insinuate that there exists a coefficient of the untrans for the untra untranslatable, or that the higher its yield, the more superior of a work of art is in the host or guest language. I repeat, what is untranslatable is not limited to concepts, images, metaphors, ironies, word association, but also is found in music, rhythm, and breath. Par excellence, the ailment of originality in our time has within it a capitalist illusion that has bewildered us all. At this point, I'd just point uh, to Raymond Williams' uh, key words there, fun to read. Breath itself is an aporia of being. Yes, we share the same air, and we all have lungs and capillaries, but no two bodies breathe in the same manner, and so it is in poem. All I'm asking is how much of Palestine and the Palestinian is untranslatable breath in English. In every work of art, the untranslatable, the unnamed, is in fragments strewn over the work. Sometimes it is hidden, buried, sunk to a bottom, or evaporated into an atmosphere. Fragments that disperse in various elements and must be recuperated, illuminated, reborn with an E. Fragments that identify various essences that lend themselves to the imagination. This is where the politics of reception can close itself up in prejudice to what it might deem as uninfluential, as if the highest order of translation is that which offers the host language as it barricades itself, a chance to discover an acceptable dormancy within its folds via translation work from a foreign tongue. First, the foreign tongue itself must be acceptable. In the politics of reception, we have Fitzgerald and Khayyam, but not Rihani and Ma'ari, Pound and the Chinese cantos. Invariably, it is a native poet translator, bona fide and true, who can uncover the potentialities of his or her own language to their kin through translation. As if and if not a native son or daughter, then an acceptable transplant. All in the family. Rarely are foreigners granted that privilege unless they meet conditions of nativity. Think Conrad or Novikov. Just as every language carries within it its own genetic material of the untranslatable, that which would infuse it, would, would infuse in it new life, it also carries within it its own chauvinism recidivism, and xenophobia. Originality is theological dogmatism. Translation is not the reproduction of this divinity, but its annihilation.
We're almost there. In 1984, Darwish elegized his assassinated friend Majid Abu Sharar. In the poem's concluding section, there are four sections, there's a refrain that names the beloved. Does anyone know this one? Sabah al Khairi Majid. Sabah al Khairi Majid, Sabah al Khair, Kumikra Surat al Aid, Wahutha Sayr, Ila Beladin Fakadnahu, Bihadith Sayr. Good morning, Majid. Good morning. Rise and read the surah of the returnee and get going to a country we lost in a traffic accident. In Arabic, the stanza is in prosody and rhyme, where Majid rhymes with the returnee and the good in mourning rhymes with traffic, but in English, the order of adjunct and genitive are reversed. How does one capture the effect of the returnee in English? It is a magnificent moment in Arabic, arguably a moment of untranslatability. There is no surah in the Quran with the title with that title or theme. Darwish creates something divine while tossing many glances around, among them a glance toward myth, another toward history, and yet another toward heresy. And every heresy is a liberation. How does one translate and arrive at that third line in that stanza? Is it possible to translate it without translating the entire poem? Can one translate the untranslatable as severed or decontextualized fragment from its maternal or, bo or own body? Of course one can. But it is worth remembering that translating such moments as orphaned is likely to, to lead to different articulation because the flow and life of what precedes it determines the nature of the arrival to and in the untranslatable. It's like sequencing poems or short stories in a collection. The sequence affects the final edits of the individual components. Similarly, the sequencing and translation of selected or complete works influences the editorial spirit of the translation. The syntactical and rhythmic choices one makes cannot be strayed from too far as this translation moves ahead. It's a lock in and go fair. Once you start it, it, it really creates its own limitations. Otherwise, the concept of unity, as T.S. Eliot might have it, is destabilized. Destabilization is okay, of course, if it exists in the work of art undergoing translation, because in those works, disruption or discontinuity lend itself to cohesion. Whatever the shifting registers may be, uniformity is a precarious business. In translation, it will inevitably lead to moments of soft bellies, mistranslation, awkward usage, etc. Imitation versus theft. A task then represents itself. How does one transform soft bellies into moments that call the self of the reader, the recipient, and the translator face to face with a critical consciousness? Can we say that when we say translation, we mean the alleles of the untranslatable in the so-called gene? of the text? What is the heart of the Darwish, that Darwish line? Read or recite the surah of the returnee. If you agree that it is the invocation and subversion of the divine, the secularization of it, then how do you go about a translation that captures it in English? Whatever you do, you are consigned to a politics of reception. And whatever you do, you must solve for the music first as the primary hope, and hope, by definition, is always misplaced. Were it not, it would be an expectation, a statistical outcome, a mere reproducibility. What if I changed Majid's name to Ali and said, good morning, Ali, good morning, rise to recite the surah of the returnee for the sake of rhyme? Or, good morning, Ali, good morning, why don't you rise and recite the returnee to me? Or, I can translate the meaning of Majid's name into English. Good morning, Majid, my glory, good morning, will you get up and read me the returnee? Or, depending on the flow of the preceding, preceding translated lines, Majid, good morning, 
Get up, it's morning. Rise and recite the verses of one who returns. Nearly 30 years later, in a Darwish poem titled, Not as a Foreign Tourist Does, we find references to Yeats, but we also find the syntax of disappearance. Three abandoned churches, broken minarets, home oak on either side, villages like dots erased from their letters. Or is it off their letters? In Arabic, the phrase, villages erased like dots off their letters, confuses the antecedent through its use of the passive form of erase. Literally and prosaically, it would read like this, villages that are like dots on letters that have been erased. Though in Arabic, there's a small but sizable grammatical argument that can be made as to whether the antecedent is the dots or their letters in this construction of the passive form. In English, there are two dotted letters, and only when in lower case are they dotted. In German, there are more, and in French, one can imagine an, a numerical advantage in the structurally accented vowels, perhaps. Most importantly, in Arabic, half the, of the alphabet is dotted. In Arabic, whether the letters or dots are erased, the loss is equally remarkable. The erasure is 50%. The topography is unreadable, yet unforgettable and unforgotten. The text is utterly decontextualized, yet remains firmly and wholly in place. Later in the poem, Darwish persists. It is not a dream, nor is it a symbol that leads to a national bird it is a cloud that has ripened. How does a place become a reflection of its image in myth or an adjective of speech? And as, and I, a as, and as a Palestinian and American, I walk around the alphabet of this Palestinian poem and I ask myself, have I become a foreign tourist? Or am I the one who knows and shapes what a foreign tour tourist reads? Let me end with this leaping thought about love. Sonnet four, in the stranger's bed, Seri al Ariba, 98, a collection. Begins with a pine tree in your right hand, a willow in your left. This is summer. One of your hundred gazelles has surrendered to the dew and slept on my shoulders near one of your regions. And what if the wolf notices and a forest burns in the distance? As the poem goes on, it leaves me face to face with a critical question. Is this eco-poetry as love poem or is it love poem as eco-poetry? It's impossible for me to read some of Darwish's love poems without thinking of an actual lover or person. I also cannot shake off from my mind Darwish's singular relationship to nature, his elegy for the earth and his praise for its beauty, its companionship, its mutualism. Does Darwish not point us back to what we lost in our contemporary modern or postmodern aesthetic and intellectual world with regards to the earth? Who speaks of this in his work and in what language? The politics of reception also concern the politics of reading in Arabic, which also influences other politics of reception in English and in translation, to be fair. Not many read some of Darwish's love poems as love poems for the earth. Who reads the Red Indian's penultimate speech to the white man as a song against the Anthropocene and the machine of the nation state? We were once one with other creatures on earth, before progress came to us with its new names. In Arabic, we should investigate our will willingness to love ourselves and others, to navigate the desire for liberation from an interiorized or against an interiorized inferiority toward dictums of power. To translate Darwish is to translate what is more beautiful than self-immolation in the name of emulation, what is more beautiful than self-love in the name of othering. 
Let it be this instead, that your sleepiness is stronger than fear. Let it be that a wilderness of your beauty dozes off and a moon out of your shadows wakes to guard its trees. I wonder what Al-Jahid would have to say about this oneness with the an animate world, to translate the natural world away from the machine of the world. I wonder what he would have to say were he alive today, completing his book of animals, and he came across this Darwish line, trust in water, O dwellers of my song. Thank you. Thank you very much for bearing with me. I know that was uh, maybe Thank you too for long. Thank fascinating and very dense and layered lecture that I think will uh, take us some time to uh, some time for reflection before we can begin to to ask questions. And thank you also for you know instructing us in new languages, new translations of translation itself. You know, I you know all the entire lexicon and metaphors and comparisons that you have brought forth from science and medicine in order to. Um, take us out of the ordinary, hackneyed, perhaps, ways of thinking and articulating uh, the process. I'm personally, I'm very, very grateful. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm sure we all have questions. Uh, you touched very briefly on the American Native Indian, and I just would like you to expand a little bit on how the Palestinians might feel a kinship for the Native Americans and with um, colonies being put up by the Israelis, similar to our expanding to the West. Um, you know, it's a, uh, thank you. Uh, it's an interesting uh, question, but um, recently I'd read a review uh, or a, a review of a book in uh, the New York Review of Books um, by actually uh, the lovely writer Raja Shahada of a book uh, published by University of California about uh, sort of settler colonialism in the Amerindian indian model. Uh, and, uh, and he sort of briefly touches on the similarities well, not, very, not briefly at all. He, it's, it's most of what the article is about. Um, but I found myself a, a bit drawn away from that kind of um, language, if you will, or speech act almost, if I may be a little harsh. Um, I personally find myself interested in having a, um, an open public conversation in America, and I don't think my America can handle it just yet, about the South African model. And the reason is not just to use words like BDS or apartheid or what have you, but actually because, with all due respect, um, the uh, Native American model consigns the Palestinian to the dead. It is not necessarily a model that and I want to be very careful about this without necessarily um, dismissing or uh, disrespecting the horrors of the Native American experience. But essentially, in the Native American experience, we have, we, we have a, a genocide, uh, almost a complete genocide. And there is something about the permissibility of that parallel that was not necessarily permissible before in sort of Western and, or in English, let me just speak of English, that just uh, somehow makes me want to scratch my head. And it bothers me because it is, it consigns the Palestinian tragedy again to the permissibility of necropolitics again. You know, that's, it's good to talk. Now you can argue and say that, well, it wants to prevent a repetition of that. Um, if that's the case, I, I would rather uh, the vital, even if deeply problematic, model of South Africa. Um, 
So that's one way to answer that question. Um, another way to answer that question is to actually uh, hope that you'd uh, read uh, Darwish's poem uh, itself, um, which is, you know, it's in a, a, a poetry collection called Eleven Planets, written in 1992, as uh, uh, sort of as he says in, in one of his readings, is the fifth, 500 years in the commemoration of the, not Columbus, but uh, on, the, on the fall of Granada, on the last Arab leaving uh, Andalusia, or Andalus. And it's an interesting book in the sense that it does really speak of, as I mentioned in some of the passages or the phrases, this idea of the switch that began to happen in humanity uh, where um, w our association, and I'm not necessarily saying, you know, I'm not making a judgment on the problematic of progress or what have you, but there's a shift in 1492, poetically, or sort of uh, like Stendhal says in his essay in the mysticism of world history, if you want to see it that way in a, in a less scholarly historical fashion, that there's a shift uh, from our association to, uh, to the earth, with the earth, and also with war, you know, with the performance of that sort of first major genocide that we recognize really in our, in our sort of human history, um, um, if you consider the span of 500 years ago, we speak of that as an initial moment. Um, so so it, it's a poem, it's a poem or a text worth reading. Um, but yeah, um, uh, yeah, I, I do think that there is a um, solidarity and a, um, a hum, human camaraderie that we all have with the, with the Native Americans. Uh, obviously, if you live in the States, you know that uh, um, there are many uh, uh, Zionists who uh, also associate with the Native American uh, experience and tragedy. So, you know, this notion of wanting to, um, the problematic of co-opting or siding with other people's tragedies sort of to make a parallel it becomes a sort of an open field historically. It serves itself to power dynamics, and that's why I go back to that notion of I would like a vital example, um, a more vital example, if permissibility allows, which I don't think we're there yet. Thank you very much for this brilliant and dense talk. I would really like to see it written too so that I can read it and reread it. Um, I will not get credit for it. <laughs> the credit is yours. But I thought you, um, when, when dealing with Mahmoud Darwish, you emphasized perhaps too much that he's a Palestinian. Well, it's no doubt he's a Palestinian, a spokesperson for the Palestinian cause, but he's a poet. So when you said, what would a native speaker of English do when they read Darwish, how much of Palestine they can uh, absorb and so on, how necessary is it, you know, uh, to, to, to even know about Palestine when reading Mahmoud Darwish? Unless, of course, if you're using Palestine in the sense of loss or ongoing loss or all of us are Palestinian or, you know, some kind of an existential uh, meaning of Palestine, but not Palestine, the country, the place we can point to on a map. If I may follow up, because I was going to ask almost the same question, you know, how do you assess the politics of reception. I mean, you seem to say that if you're translating Derwish into Portuguese or Spanish or French, that's one thing. But translating Derwish into English seems to bring forth a different politics of reception. And I can understand where that's coming from. But how do you assess that? And having assessed it, how do you deal with it as a translator? What kinds of decision making right, do you have to deal with once you have assessed if it is accessible? Right? 
Um, so one way, uh, you know, I, I, again, I found myself writing this essay thinking that I am going to be writing a very, very long, maybe multi-essay thing on, on this relationship to translation and, you know, Hassan Zaktan would come into it and I just came back from Petra and I translated this brilliant poem by Amjad Nasser on Petra and whose also work I've done. So I, I feel like you've uh, undone a demon uh, by forcing me to present something here. So thank you for that. Um, uh, so so I, I don't disagree and um, uh, with what you're saying. But I, one way to, uh, again, it's really, I think, a paradox. I don't think you'll ever have, will ever be able to answer it. <sighs> Can you read Paul Celan, which is not the only example, or Nazem Hekmet, or whoever, or Pablo Neruda, without understanding, the answer is yes, without understanding uh, that, that Paul Celan uh, survived and suffered the Holocaust, or Nazem Hekmet you know, survived the new uh, Turkish state uh, at the time, uh, or Pablo Neruda and, and Chile and so forth. Do you have a deeper reading is perhaps the question of their work, understanding their place in human history as individuals, as each one of us has a place in human history. And I think that the, the, the second part of my question is, do you have a deeper reading, I think is important. Darwish, and we were talking about this earlier, with many people in his generation and maybe the generation that followed, um, wrote you know, they were exiled or lived outside, but rode back to an Arabic center. That, that was their conversation was with, their, with the world through their own language. Um, he struggled, and we all know, with people, and I say this in, in some of the, uh, you know, talk, people always saying, Arabi, and all these kind of echoic uh, slogans and so forth which prevented people from reading, uh, reading him as a sort of a person who continued to transform himself. Some of the phrases I have in here, echo is one, um, my language a metaphor for metaphor, whatever, they're quotes from his later poems. So I think actually um, uh, it's worth uh, me writing about it in this way, but I think actually it's a trap in English worse than it is in Arabic. Um, Speaking about Darwish as a non-Palestinian, you know, or not as a non-Palestinian, but putting that to the side, so to speak, is actually convenient in English. It would be lovely if actually it's never mentioned. Um, he would be a safe Palestinian to handle. Uh, when Darwish died, for example, uh, the obituaries, uh, which came, you know, fast and plenty and true, they were absolutely meaningless in the, say, in the New York Times or these kinds of things. And absolutely catchphrases and nothing. There's absolutely no understanding of the work. Although there are people like Aga Shahid Ali or Edward Said or others before me who had written, you know, uh, about his work or, or made some of his really important work available. Um, the condition of exile. I mean, how do you think of Edward Said, for example? You know, do, do, do you not, does anyone not think of Edward Said as a Palestinian? Does it take away from his work? So I think we're, maybe I would like to argue that we're, we somehow, in Arabic, confuse Darwish's agony about his own art, which is a, a, a problem, perhaps, of the culture of, you know, uh, the richness of criticism in, in Arabic with the question of it in, in English. Um, uh, at the same time, the examples I chose, um, you know, I remember having this conversation with Darwish about, uh, you know, some poem I was translating, and he was like, feel free in that poem to erase some things, he told me. And I said, you know, stop being harsh on yourself. He says, yes, I am, I am too harsh on myself. And I said, yeah, it's okay, it'll be okay, I'm not gonna erase anything. Um, and you know, so I said, why? He said, uh, um, uh, I know it's a long poem, and he said, I just think it's too, I'm too talkative in it. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't about Palestine, it was an aesthetic uh, uh, you know, concern that he had. Um, but I do think that the examples I chose, and speaking of Paul Celan, are, I think they're, they're linguistically and intellectually, they're phenomenal. 
And the fact that, that you, we think that they would be lessened or the, because of their Palestinian association is purely a politics of reception. Um, so I do not think, for example, like Qasidat Majid Abu Sharar is absolutely stunning. Now it is, I have, I ask myself a question when I get to the end of it and he says, and I didn't read that phrase, um, in the last, uh, says, uh, then gather Palestinian flesh, gather in one and fold your arm to write the surah of one who returns. Um, now I understand that, you know, I pause and I, and I wonder about that sort of, uh, even uh, I think you, you know, you could bring in the blasphemous idea of saying the chauvinism of it. Uh, you know, the idea that you have this kind of centricity that, um, but we know from Darwish's text or life and works that he went, he went even past Palestine as a metaphor. So that's what I mean. The, 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 some of his brilliant earlier work is hard to touch in English without the stigma that comes so fast. Um, and I think it's, it's worth having a, a resistance against it. Now, um, uh, to answer your question, I, uh, the simple answer is, I think if, if, uh, if it's possible to assess the politics of reception, some of us would really be either powerful or rich people. Um, um, because I think it's obviously, as you know, it's a very chronic problem. Um, and uh, I, I remember Spivak uh, in one of her essays sort of, like in a just, a, I love the phrase, and she was like, uh, referred to the, Arab, the, the, the older Arabs or the ancient Arabs as imperial translators. And so there is this, you know, I mean, uh, the, the idea that when you have so much power and influence, you do what you want. With, with a text and you, and you distribute it the way you want and you interpret it the way you want. And it, there is truth in it. So I think that, you know, there is this question of, you know, which I tried to touch on in this phrase of not as a foreign tourist does, you know, am I an imperial translator or not? Or to what extent do I resist that as someone who likes to straddle that space of, of uh, uh, exile, for lack of a better word? Um, but it's a, it's a fair question to ask. I know uh, from my experience um, that one way I wanted to counter it, uh, navigate it, assess it, uh, was really um, not uh, trust my English in a sense, not question, not try to transform what I did or what I. Uh, Trans, you know, the text that I transferred, then transformed into um, into the, the the contemporary poetic English diction. I left the awkward and perhaps the mistranslated, and I left. I focused on a you know, um, I guess you know there are echoes in there of many other people who've talked about translation, but the, sort of the you know the, the 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 as Benjamin would say, sort of the spirit of the text. But I can't I can't explain how one does it technically because, as I said, in you know I like that phrase in Lukash's thing. You know, it's not a perfect technical eminence. It, there really is a mysticism in the act, and I don't think I can or anyone can actually. Uh, explain it. Uh, uh, if you want me to explain to you my, um, um, uh, to use the pun, my darwesha moment, <laughs> you know, while I translate, then I can explain to you how I bederwesh when I or I write. But, um, um, no, but it seems to me you gave, for example, uh, several versions of uh, the transla possible translations for one poem. Right. And, uh, you know, maybe we can use that as, as an example. What makes you then ultimately, you know, decide on the final translation? Are you taking into account, as you do so, therefore, those politics of reception? No, uh, what makes me decide on it is, uh, and I tried to suggest it earlier, is the idea of uh, the, what, what is considered a, a whole, a whole body. Uh, 
uh, for me because I chose, for example, in Darwish's case, in Zaftan's case, it was a little different because it was selected works. In Darwish's case, it was three volumes back to back. Um, and so what made, uh, part of what made the decisions for me was the way that I had to read the book sort of from beginning to finish and make sure that it reads in the same breath. And so what, what happens when, when I did that, uh, and I think as, as with, any, with any translation, as, as I think with any writing, you encounter moments that where you're, the rules that you have set for yourselves are completely, they just reach a dead end and you just hope nobody, <laughs> nobody sees it and you move on. Um, and then, you know, in my personal experience, I found that um, later on, when I, years would pass and I would read my own work in English translation, uh, you know, my poetry in translation, and, and I, I would be completely shocked. I have, I have no, it's almost like I have no recollection what, what it is that led me to that. Um, but. Yes. Um, you mentioned at one point in your lecture that translation morphs into literary criticism. And I'm assuming you mean creative translation here. Um, so are you saying that translating a work is like critiquing a work, or is it like communicating your own interpretation of a work? Yeah, both. I, I think what I'm, in a simpler way of saying it, which I also mentioned, it's reading is the first act of translation and the first act of literary criticism. But one wants to be careful of turning that too much into, you know, I also sort of have echoes of Edward Said's secular criticism essay, which is worth reading. None of these are about translation, but um, uh, in these essays, I mean. Um, but yes, so it's just about, you know, the act of reading. Even in the, you know, the mother language, I think it's an act of translation. Um, yeah, do, do, you, do, you, do you remember, you know, for life to become functional, you have to translate the RNA, um, uh, not just the DNA is sort of, yeah, uh, into proteins. And that, in genetic language, is called translation. DNA into uh, uh, RNA is called transcription and DNA into DNA is called replication. And so it's, a, it's an interesting choice of language. I know these things are obviously artificial, the, the choice is for, it's not like God sent down that this is called translation. Um, but the fact is the proteins are without, you know, without them, if you don't go through that, you can replicate the DNA all you want, but without translating the RNA, you're not gonna have a viable cell that has machinery for it to produce. Um, and so I, I think that's, you know, same way when you read a text, and you know, and I and I am biased to poetry for obvious reasons, but I, I'm not so sure I'd, I'd have a good heart of trying to be harsh. You know, I think philosophy, like translation of some of the lyrical philosophers or some of the uh, philosophers or some of the um, novelists uh, and so forth. It's yeah, it's it's not easy. Yes. Two things I would like to say. First, I'm delighted at every word you said, and I wish one day I will have it in text material, although I'm concentrating a lot, because every sentence you said is very rich in meaning. So because it is the sort of thing that has to be read and reread. Secondly, uh, I want to take advantage of your presence here and if effectively ask you a question. In asking the question, I give you my own background all these years, what I thought about translation. And I shall be brief. For example, I always felt <coughs> that transla when translating, there is really translating the untranslatable. Take, for example, a specific example, an Arabic poem, one sentence from pre-Islamic literature. It has to be read this way. But effectively, what is in it is a noon harf ranin onomatopoeia. You know what I mean? This verse, correct me, for me, 
at this stage in my life is untranslatable. Correct. So I would like your comment on that because what really matters in it is the onomatopoeia in it. And uh, pre-Islamic poetry is fantastic. When he's talking about death, he says, um, um, using the dot to make you feel the pain. I, I will never be able to translate it. So this is point number one I'm saying. Secondly, I come from Egypt and I'm, I'm a man who loves the desert. And when I was a sophomore at this university, I opened the book and I suddenly read a phrase which said, the ancient fathers went to the desert to hear the voice of silence. It hit a chord in me and this was a turning point in my life. And I sit with mystics who say two words or four words and they rhyme, which I can never translate. So the, the essence is in not the words, but in something else, in the mysticism, etc., which you alluded to. So if I am right in feeling that generally people translate the untranslatable, if I look politically, economically, etc., at the whole world and say someone is in country X, reading a translated text from country Y, and he only has, he has, he only knows this language and reads that. Does this, generally speaking, in the world as a whole, people can talk about globalization, people are fond of fashion, you know, and all that, etc. I feel that people can still be apart and not understanding each other. I stop here and I need your guidance. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I, um I think that you, you know, um, uh, sort of echo Al Jahal fi Kitab al Hayawan, where uh, he says uh, that, uh, you know, he suggests that this whole idea of translating poetry is just uh, absurd because all that remains in the translation is translation, translating already known facts or feelings across the human. So what's the point of telling somebody that I feel longing for my beloved or so forth, um, you, know, because it, you know, because they understand that feeling in English. Why do they need to know that somebody in Arabic wrote it um, in such a manner? Uh, but I think his argument was, was not to obviate translation, uh, but actually to emphasize the need for um, transformative process, which is to say um, uh, the untranslatable for me is actually about an acceptance of disappearance um, it, it, to an extent. Um, in, in other words, uh, no one, you, you know, he has that famous story about this uh, uh, man who sits and on his right there are Arabs, and on his left there are Persians. And he, he speaks to the, uh, the Arab audience, the, 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 the Pharisees, the Persians would speak something to him, he would turn instantly and tell them, to tell the Arabs, and then the Arabs would say something back, sort of like this, uh, what do we call now in the UN, the instant translator or the, inter yeah, and uh, which, which was a mess in the, uh, uh, Nuremberg trials, um, but it was, I think, the first modern experience was in the Nuremberg trials, which is, some essays are worth reading on that. Um, yeah, but, and, and Al-Jahad says that's impossible, and I agree with him, and I've seen some of these immediate interpreters, uh, it's just impossible. Um, uh, but I, I believe that it's possible only in certain moments, and it is about a state of being. So while the uh, assonance or the relationship between sounds in Arabic is not duplicated in any other language, my, the, it's, a, it's a choice one deals with, um, which is to say, uh, perhaps the translation is to seek something else in English that the English speaker see, deems untranslatable and you receive it in its return in Arabic. It does not have to be the exact same thing. There, there is this problematic, again, of the divine, of the self as such a singular um, 
moment that fears, you know, I said that the part of what we, we say when we say untranslatable is almost a euphemism for a survival against self-death or mutilation. And so language becomes for us um, some unique thing that you don't want to abandon, that it has to maintain its singularity uh, forever. And I think that we, we, I can understand that feeling. I think anyone can, uh, whether they speak Arabic or any other language or Mandarin or, you know. Uh, but I think that I, I, I guess I am, I'm just trying to say that the insistence on the untranslatable uh, is a problematic uh, that I struggle to navigate and choose not to dwell on. Um, uh, but I, I understand. You know, I, I think it would be a, a better conversation to have, say, with a, a true you know, linguist, for example, someone who's a true philologist and see, you know, and a neuroscientist. And I think that there is more that we're learning you know, uh, about these things. And, but I do believe that the human mind is more one than not, far more. Um, and uh, yeah, but again, I, I, I will admit that I, these, there are no answers for your, there are no clear cut answers for your uh, question. I think they're just, in the end, choices we make. Actually, yeah, could I ask a question too? Um, I thought it was fascinating how you, you know, really used all the details about the human body and sort of biological details. And obviously, I know that you have a background in medicine and that you're a doctor and I was wondering, I don't know, I just had this thought all of a sudden, to what extent you could sort of liken a translator to a doctor, you know, sort of um, knowledge of the body and knowledge of, you know, the different functions, but also sort of this responsibility, you know, to kind of intervene on a body and I don't know if there's a healing aspect. I was just sort of thinking about, you know, the if you could compare at all the doctor, the role of a doctor to the role of a translator in some way. Um, yeah, I, I haven't thought about it this way for selfish reasons uh, against what I said, which is, you know, I consider myself a poet first and foremost, so, um, so I don't uh, get too stuck in the idea of the translator, which is an interesting stigma. Again, I spoke about, uh, I, and I mean the word stigma, um, for a creative or original writer. Um, some people, uh, uh, you know, there's a politics of reception there too. Um, but. I, in general, I, I don't know if, if you want to liken it, it's a metaphor I'll to see. being a physician. Uh, you can liken being a professor uh, with his or her students to being a physician. Um, I'm, not, I'm no longer a fan of the, uh, um, uh, the uh, what's the word, the aura of the physician uh, <laughs> in the 21st century. That's a complicated conversation. <laughs> I have a question. I want to go back to this idea of translation as annihilation. An annihilation, yes. Right? Whose annihilation? I mean, it seems to be a very complex and complicated well, process. It goes back to uh, what the professor suggested, I think. Uh -huh. uh, obviously, it's a term borrowed from astrophysics uh, and, and, you know, and, and uncertainty principle and the idea of the particle movements and, and when a particle and antiparticle collide, there's an annihilation, but there is energy still. Uh, um, so there's a loss of the original properties of the particle and antiparticle, but the energy still remains. So if you bring certain moments of translating, for example, um, a muallaqa, uh, if you want to go to something more complex than just um, uh, and, and you, you put it through into English, there has to be annihilation, and it is well, what perhaps uh, uh, the professor is referring to, uh, which is this idea that you, you, you lose certain properties of the particle and you, um, uh, in this collision, and also there are certain properties that are lost in the antiparticle, in the host right. language, yeah. and there are new energies that we are, we are incapable of measuring without a true reading, a transformative, you know, an ex a willingness to receive the work as a transformation in order to measure, um, to use the scientific uh, terms, this new energy that's created. So the annihilation has to be uh, of some original properties of the of the work that's being transferred, and also in the new work. 
because I refuse to think that the idea of translation is, um, is about making it seem as if it is written in English. I disagree with that uh, immensely, and it makes me suspect of the work being transferred or the act of the translation. But of course, that's just an argument. I, I, I'm not that dogmatic about that. But yeah, I, I found it fascinating, I think, the, the collection of metaphors uh, that exist already in human language and other human disciplines and scientific disciplines for translation. Absolutely. So, so I think maybe I was trying to bombard everyone with that. And, and you know, you, you can have your own journey and read Stephen Hawking or something, you know, <laughs> and, and, and uh, yeah. Okay, we, I think we have time for one final question. Did, oh, did this help you to translate uh, Darwish's verse, or did it make it more difficult for you? Uh, no, it doesn't make it difficult. I mean, I, I know that I'm not uh, as gifted. <laughs> I, I didn't need translation to tell me that. But um, uh, no, it helps. I, I think it helps as a serious act of engagement with any text and the process of, you know, reading and writing and thinking about words and language and just many, many things happen. Um, you really uh, get to an essence uh, of uh, language and of uh, thinking of uh, the intellect uh, that is really hard to explain unless you uh, maybe warm your hand with it a little bit. And, and did you translate Sabra? There's a poem called Sabra. It's about uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think there is a poem called Sabra. I think the, what he talks about in Sabra and Shatila is in a long poem called Madih uh, al which, uh, yeah, which I did not translate, no. No. This is 1983, so it's an earlier poem, problematic enough as it is, again, in the politics of reception, and I think, uh, yeah, the time will come. Not for me, but, you know. Triel. Um, You know, about, there are a number of great poets who have translated, you know. Uh, Ezra Pound is one of the Merwin, and, and so on and so forth. But the fear or the anxiety about it is that they will translate what is in the foreign language into their own poetics. In other words, they occupy the other text. Right. Do you feel that? Uh, how, do you, how would you react to that? Um, I react uh, by sharing with you that I have abandoned translation, uh, no, uh, for a period I don't know, because I began to feel that when, you, you know, I, I have like just a new book out for uh, Zaktan, but I finished that book in like three or four years ago. But in the last three years or so, it, whenever I sort of dabbled with translation or editing this uh, new collection, I, 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 so I noticed my hand trying to edit in a um, co-optive way that uh, alarmed me a little bit. Uh, in my work, if you read my own poetry in English, that um, coincided with the time that I was doing the other translations, you will see that I, there are two different Englishes, if one may say. There's a subtle, there's definitely a noticeable difference. Not just because, it's not a matter of these are not his words. It is, they're just different syntactical English. Uh, there's an insistence on an idea of uh, my relationship to the syntax and the translation that is not the way I manage my own syntax and my own poems, which is still you know, influenced by Arabic, but it's it's a much diff negotiated very differently in my own work than in translation. And, uh, but I, I felt lately that I am beginning to sort of take on uh, translation in sort of this domineering sense. Um, and uh, and so I stepped away. It, it, it Then it feels to me as a, uh, you know, Ezra Pound is absolutely an imperial translator. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it's a, it's a very interesting uh, moment. For example, um, recently there's been a lot of talk in Arabic uh, uh, studies uh, about Shidiak's book, uh, Leg Over Leg. And there was this uh, review of it 
by uh, Robin Creswell in the, the New York Review of Books. Uh, um, and uh, he, towards the end, he sort of mentions that there was a lot of seja uh, in, in certain moments and long passages, speaking of the untranslatable. Uh, that, that uh, I, I forget who, who did the translation, was it Humphrey, Davies? Humphrey, Humphrey Davies. Davies, yeah. Uh, couldn't capture, and he tried to do something with it, but of course Robin decides to uh, offer the decree that it fails. Uh, of course, there is Kalito writing that Maqamat al-Hamadani and al-Hariri, maybe they're untranslatable because you can't produce that much. Maybe they're meant to be untranslatables because you can't produce that much sajjah. Or maybe we'll find out that we can do that, but much later in time. But the interesting moment comes after this little dig that, you know, when we review books or whatever, we always feel like you have to make a, a dig at somebody else in case anybody suspects that you're not smart. Um, and then he follows it by this moment of saying, and I'm paraphrasing, to date, he says, to date, there have been no translators of the Arabic into English who have been able to offer English what Ezra Pound was able to offer English through his translations of the cantos. And I thought it was a most, a most brilliant sentence that I don't think he will ever live down unless, but, but people don't call him on it. But it was also a, a call to arms, if you will, or a declaration of your true belonging, in a sense that you're saying that, some of the things I refer to, uh, that I as native decide who offers my language from whatever other foreign language, what I consider, a, wh who brings to life a dormant energy. And none of these people are Ezra Pound. So it's a, it's a bizarre moment of claiming your allegiance a troubled moment, to say the least. But um, yeah, I you know. But I did speak once with a Chinese American poet uh, friend who told me that she felt that Ezra Pound c captured the spirit of the Chinese on those poems very well. I have no way to judge her. Her Chinese is is certainly uh, pretty good. So I, I don't know. I think these things are. I feel sometimes that they're. Um, uh, um, they, they really are distracting arguments. Um, uh, as I say, it's a, sort of like a limitation of human consciousness or something. Um, Carolyn Forche translating Darwish, well, she didn't, she edited Darwish. Others translated it and she, and she edited it into her own poetics. You know that this is her signature. I mean, it's lovely, it's great, it's fine. You know, people, a lot more people come and give me compliments about my translation. Okay, fine, but you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not that, uh, in, at the end of the day, I really am not uh, uh, militant about uh, the word. Um, but yeah, but I don't employ it, as I say, I don't, I, I don't employ it to, you know, toward a reification of power. I'm, I'm just a Palestinian at the end of the day. No, I read them in Arabic, uh, and yeah, no, I, and, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, and I'm sure in Arabic there are also different edited versions, so that's another. Ah, well. Yeah, no, no, I, I couldn't. You probably should steer me in, in, on that one. Okay, well, one more question. Sort of double casquette, at least double. It's um, your many faceted professional life. How constraining is it? How constrained are you in in these multiple fields by the existence of the others? I mean, would you uh, would you like to drop medicine, for example, and be a full time translator, poet, or? I, w I would not be a full-time trans. I would. Uh, I. I think I'm sort of again indefinitely done with translation. Uh, I uh, uh, because I think it's for me. It's a. It's a process that is closely linked with again with with the creative aesthetic, uh, with a transformative process. So whenever I feel that a translation for me is sort of a a technical act, I 
I don't touch it. Um, uh, um, you know, I've been, I, I graduated medical school in 1996, so I'm approaching 22 years as a doctor. Um, and I'll tell you, it's a lifetime. It's enough. Who among us, in whatever job they have, and it's you know long enough, just at some point, who among us does not, at some point feel like, well, if life was easy enough for me to say, I've been there, done that, now let me go do something else and live another 20 years in it, you know? Or maybe it's just the fickle poet in me, I don't know. <laughs> So but you choose you choose the poet over the. I, I would choose writing over medicine now, sure. Um, but I uh, the best I can do for now is work uh, sort of manage my time in medicine as part time, so it'll allow me. It's not even a time for writing. It just yeah. allows me time to be a little bit more sentient. I think. Uh, um, so. And we will conclude with that because I. No, yeah. Thank you, Kai. Uh, I, just about someone doing something and then saying it is a lifetime and then I do something else, etc. For whatever it is worth, I, I just say to you a sentence or two about my experience. I'm a, I'm a professor of economics and a very technical economist by training, empirical econometrics. But I still teach economics. But as the years go by, I teach economics more and more in a different way mm. by linking, and because my hobby is literature, Arabic literature and English literature, and I can keep quoting literature, poems, poems etc., until tomorrow morning, you know. I, so as time goes by, I have been linking economics with literature, with all these other hobbies I have, with, with, uh, with proverbs, for example. I mean, just, mm. I lectured even abroad how Egypt got through the Great Recession of 2008, and I was right when we sat here in 2008, and they said Egypt will get through it, and we will grow at 5%, we grew at 5.5%. Other countries didn't, because they love borrowing, and we don't like to borrow, and because of five proverbs, <laughs> These five proverbs, honestly, forget about all my technical economics, are what resulted in a situation where this country grew at 5.5% in the Great Recession. Yeah. Exactly. <coughs> so, and I love proverbs, and I, so as I grow, I keep my discipline and I link it with literature, I link it with grammar. For example, I make them distinguish between globalization and globalism. I say, because I studied lots of grammar as a young child. Uh, both are nouns, one is an abstract noun, but they have different connotations, etc., etc. Sure. So I keep it, but keep linking it with other things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for an amazing evening and a truly brilliant lecture, really, get there.